We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I am your moderator and host, Dr. Lauren Levine. Welcome to all of you. We had a great turnout, uh, over a thousand people registered, obviously an exciting topic and, uh, and a fantastic speaker. So we're thrilled to have all of you here. Um, yeah, as always, I hope that everyone's staying safe and healthy uh, here in California. We sort of, uh, you know, we're, we're clear. I guess uh, June 15th was the day that uh, apparently we don't need masks in for most places. So I assume a lot of the country is uh, in, this, in a similar spot. Uh, as always, I commend you for your ongoing commitment to dental education. Um, Every time we do these webinars and we're with a thousand people, we usually have about 150 or so that haven't been on the webinars in the past. So um, this is more directed at, at those people who aren't familiar with the format. I'm going to speak for a couple of minutes. Uh, Dr. Nazarian is going to speak for as long as he needs, which is usually around 45 to 55 minutes. We want to leave time at the end for questions. When we have a thousand people, obviously we don't do verbal questions. You, you type it in. You should all have this little uh, good webinar control panel on your screen where you can type in the questions. In almost all cases, there are more questions than we have time to answer. And I look at the questions as they come in. I try to combine some together. I try to find the major themes or try to get as many answers as possible. If I don't get to your individual question, I apologize ahead of time. The list of questions is recorded. It gets sent to, um, to Golden Dent and they can follow up uh, with you afterwards. In the next few days, look for a couple of things. First off, this webinar, as with all the webinars that we do, is being recorded. Uh, so don't worry if you can't make it to the end or get distracted. It's not a big deal. Uh, that usually goes out within usually a couple of days. So you'll, you'll get a link uh, that you can watch it at your convenience. During the webinar, uh, Dr. Nazarian is going to be demonstrating a few products and systems that he uses, which are exclusive to Golden Dent. I definitely could not do these webinars without Golden Dent sponsorship and participation. They're the ones that bring Dr. Nazari in. They bring him in. They, they help develop the content. They help make sure the invitations go out. Uh, I've been working with them for a number of years. If you're in the dental field, you know who they are. Uh, you know their commitment to dental education. So you know, thanks again to Golden Dent. Uh, speaking of Golden Dent, uh, after every webinar that we do, I get emails asking me about the CE. So I'm going to uh, try to mention it at least two or three times this evening. Uh, we always ask people asking about the continuing education credits. Basically, there's nothing you need to do other than sit here and enjoy the webinar. You have to stay for the, the bulk of the webinar. I'm not sure with HED exactly what the requirements are. I think it's like 80% or something like that. But as long as you sit here, you're going to be sent a CE certificate. There's nothing you need to do at the end. When you log out, you're not going to have any type of test to take or quiz or verification or anything like that. Uh, I send them a list of everyone that was here, when you logged in, when you logged off, and based on that, they will send out those forms. As you can imagine, when we have a thousand people registered, that can take up to a couple of weeks. So please be patient. Uh, feel free to reach out to me within a couple of weeks if you don't have it, but they're pretty good about getting them all out. Uh, and with that out of the way, once again, I wanted to welcome back Dr. Aaron Nazarian. Uh, he maintains a private practice in Troy, Michigan, uh, with an emphasis on comprehensive and restorative care. He's a diplomat of the uh, International Congress of Oral Implantologists. He's an adjunct clinical instructor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Dentistry. His articles have been published in most of the popular dental publications. He's consistently listed as a top dental educator. He's conducted just a myriad of, of lectures and hands-on workshops on aesthetic materials and dental implants throughout the U.S., Europe, Asia. Uh, he's the lead faculty for Amplified Dental Training, which uh, teaches atraumatic extractions, grafting, uh, media dentures, and all aspects of dental implants. So, Ara, we're thrilled to have you back and looking forward to tonight's presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Lauren, and welcome, everyone. Tonight, we'll be talking about Introduction to Guided Dental Implants. In the past, usually when we were placing implants, we were doing it freehand. And so first, I'd like to start out the presentation showing an example of how we would do this. We would take a look at a periapical radiograph or digital x-ray and measure the length that we thought was the best to place a dental implant. Clinically, we would go ahead and imaginary 
uh, or imagine a line from the mesial distal as well as the buccolingual to try and center the implant. And then we would go ahead and use bone calibers once the patient was numbed up to identify the thickness um, of the bony ridge that was remaining that was going to be receiving the implant. If people have a CBCT, you could take a CBCT and, and um, measure the dimensions in that case as well. But our ideal implant placement goals have always been the same. And first, we always wanted a minimum of at least a millimeter to a millimeter and a half of bone buccolingually. There should be at least a space of 1.5 to 2 millimeters from an adjacent tooth. And there should be about 3 millimeters space uh, from another implant. And the reason for that is the studies have indicated if you have two implants placed and they're less than three millimeters apart, if for some reason one of the implants has bone loss, that bone loss will quickly carry over to the other implant if it's less than three millimeters away. But if it's greater than three millimeters away, then um, the studies show that that doesn't happen um, or doesn't happen as often. So to review again, we want a minimum of about a millimeter of bone on the buccolingual aspect of the implant. There should be about 1.5 to 2 millimeters of bone um, or space, excuse me, uh, from adjacent teeth. And there should be about a three millimeter distance uh, between implants. Ideally, if we're looking in the lower ridge, we want to be about two millimeters away from the inferior alveolar nerve. And if we're looking, let's say, at a floor of the sinus, uh, for people that are beginning in their implant placement, I would recommend staying away from the floor of the sinus, about a millimeter. However, you may see some cases where we actually tap into the floor of the sinus or do a small sinus bump. But for tonight's purposes, we want to focus on these placement goals. Now, as we mentioned, radiographs, whether digital, um, or traditional were used. Um, some people have used their CBCT and not ordered any um, surgical guides, but they've used them to identify uh, the dimensions uh, for implant placement. So on this particular example, we have a CBCT, and in all CBCTs, you usually have four panes or four windows. The one window would be more of like a 2D panoramic view, you have a cross-sectional view where you can actually measure or put a virtual implant into that position. You also have a three-dimensional view as you see in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. And then lastly, in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, you see what we call the axial view. So if we look at the axial view, we wanna to try to be as centered as possible between the two adjacent teeth as well as within the ridge. We look at the 2D uh, view to identify the length and the orientation that we would want to place this implant. And then we can actually measure, and it doesn't matter what software you have. In my particular office, I have the CareStream, so it's the CS software that comes with that. But all CBCTs have a software where you're able to either measure or virtually place an implant into the region to see if in fact um, it would be able to accept uh, an implant as in this case, a 375 by eight. So we anesthetize the patient. We identify that there's plenty of keratinized tissue um, throughout the ridge. So there's no need to have to reflect a flap. So we'll just go ahead with a small tissue punch We'll use the curette and the surgical instruments and grafting kit from Golden Dent and just remove that tissue tag. We'll go through our drilling protocol, start to place our implant, take a periapical x-ray to confirm that we're on the right orientation and further drive the implant to its um, final length. Place a healing cap or a healing cover over that implant and then finally take a another radiograph to confirm that uh, the healing cap or cover screw is fully positioned. Four months postoperatively, we can see the tissue has healed very nicely. 
And so it's ready to accept an impression post. Before we do that, in my practice, I like to confirm that the implant is stable. So we'll check the ISQ, which stands for the Implant Stability Quotient. You can do this either with an Ostel measuring device um, or the Penguin, and you'll see examples of both in tonight's presentation. Since the ISQ reading is good, um, anything over 60, 65 is very good. Um, usually we see implants between 70 to 80. Very rarely are you gonna have an implant that's in a 90 because that would be something more like concrete or very, very dense um, wood. So usually 71 is uh, very ideal. And so we know we can go ahead and take the impression and complete uh, the prosthetics for the implant. Uh, let's take a look at another example of just freehanding, but we will be using the CBCT just to identify the position where we'll be placing the implant. This is very um, common amongst uh, dental practices. A lot of times patients will lose their first molar. It may have been a root canal tooth that had a vertical fracture and it was removed. Um, the area was not grafted, so there was a little bit of residual ridge that was not as ideal buccolingually as we would have liked. We look at the radiograph and we see that the height of bone is not that bad. We'd like to um, tell the patient that he should get a crown on the tooth posterior to this area, but we're gonna focus on the patient's chief complaint. Our ideal implant placement goals, again, is that there should be a minimum of a millimeter of bone buccolingually from the implant. There should be a space of about 1.5 to two millimeters from adjacent teeth. In other words, we don't wanna to get too close to adjacent teeth. Otherwise, that can cause some issues with the periodontal ligament, uh, thus irritating the tooth, uh, requiring that tooth to be endodontically treated. Also, we already talked about that implants should be at least three millimeters apart from one another and we should be about two millimeters away from the inferior alveolar nerve. Looking at the CBCT that we've acquired with the care stream, we identify the 2D view, which is like the panoramic view, the cross-sectional view, the 3D view, as well as the axial view. And in this case, we went ahead and virtually placed a five by 10 implant, and here you can see the positioning of that. Here's a closer view of the cross-sectional view, which illustrates that we're about two millimeters away from the inferior alveolar nerve canal. We identify that buccally and lingually, we have a certain dimension as well as uh, in the length. So in this particular case, we chose to go with a five by 10, a Dean Turig uh, dental implant, which has active threads, which we'll talk about momentarily. And so our goal is to anesthetize the patient. When anesthetizing the patient, we're also gonna visualize, since we are not using a surgical guide in this particular case, but just the CBCT. So we're gonna draw an imaginary line mesial distally and try to stay centered between the two teeth as well as going buccolingually. And so now we know at the cross point where the drilling protocol will start or be initiated to uh, place the implant. If we take a look at the um, periapical film, we see if we were to compare the two adjacent teeth that ideally we would prefer to be more parallel to the premolar as compared to the molar, since the molar is actually tipped more mesially. So we don't wanna tip the implant that much. We actually wanna be more parallel to the premolar in the number 29 position. Before I create the full size osteotomy, I'll always start with a 1.95 or two millimeter pilot drill, place a paralleling pin, and then take another radiograph to confirm that my orientation of the drill is, a, is as ideal as I would like. And so here you can see we're quite parallel with the premolar so we can further drill. Before we do, we're identifying where the keratinized tissue is. 
if we were to just do a tissue punch, there would not be enough keratinized tissue on the buccal aspect of that five by 10 millimeter implant. For that reason, we will reflect a flap. And so when we readapt the tissue, we'll readapt it and make the incision in such a way that there will be keratinized tissue on both buccal and lingual surfaces of the implant. So again, a great way to check this is visually um, by just stretching the cheek. A more complete way in my view is to infiltrate the area and for those areas that blanch into the white um, view or white uh, perception of the uh, gingival tissue, you can tell that there's keratinized tissue. And in the areas where the tissue balloons, we know that that's non-keratinized tissue. So this slide is great in identifying that yes, indeed, we do need to reflect a flap. Again, we'll go ahead and use the Golden Dent instruments. This is great for any surgical procedure. Not only does it have a molt and a curette and an Orban knife, but you also have tissue forceps um, as well as bone files and a bone spoon. So again, this is from Golden Dent. Here you can see where we've readapted the tissue. And so when this heals, this will have keratinized tissue on both buccal and lingual aspects of the implant. We always will confirm that the healing cap is um, tightened so that it's all the way into the implant. And again, you can see the nice aggressive threads of the Turig uh, OS implant from Adin. So being able to do freehand dental implant placement um, is very convenient. However, every now and then I have patients that present to my practice and the implant was already placed and they're like, Dr. Nazarian, can you restore this implant? Well, not only does this implant have some bone loss, but the orientation of this implant doesn't follow the basic principles that we've already reviewed this evening. And so this is what I've seen over the years coming into my practice from practitioners that may not be as experienced in placing freehand implants. In these cases, it would be highly suggested that the dental practitioner use guided dental implant placement. Here's another case where a patient presented to me wanting me to restore this. And here you can see um, this is too close to the adjacent tooth. The implant is submerged quite a bit. Uh, to me, it, it appears that it's going into the inferior alveolar nerve. Uh, patient may uh, complain about sensitivity in the uh, anterior tooth or even some numbness on that region. These are some other examples that I just got off the internet by just putting or typing in bad implant placement. So if you're going to be placing implants into patients' jaws, it is imperative that we stay in the confines of the bone, but also stay within the guidelines that we already spoke of this evening. We want to try to stay as parallel to the adjacent teeth as possible. And ideally, we want to look at these from a prosthetically driven um, aspect. Uh, ideally, we don't want this huge um, lollipop crown or large uh, restoration that has overhangs that can create um, problems in the future. So our goal tonight is to talk about guided dental implant surgery. Guided dental implant surgery allows for more precise and accurate placement of dental implants than traditional methods. In fact, there's been several studies and several papers that have taken um, students that have not really placed dental implants and they used guided dental surgery and they were just a small percentage off angle compared to doctors that may have uh, a lot of experience that were freehanding. So although I freehanded for many, many years, my preferred choice is still to go with guided dental implant surgery. With guided dental implant surgery, the CBCT scans are taken of the jaw, 
and they're used to create 3D images over the oral structures. The program uses this information to create surgical templates that determine the ideal and optimal locations for placement. So can we do freehand implant surgery? Absolutely. However, if your implant placement looks like the cases that we illustrated in the last few slides, then you will be held accountable for the um, misplaced implants. And, um, you know, that's not a good thing. So with the technology that we have today, there's absolutely no reason uh, why you shouldn't offer guided dental implant placement. Number one, it reduces risks. It makes it possible to see the anatomical structures of the jaw, of the teeth, and the surrounding tissue. In fact, the surgical time is reduced greatly. For me to do a single unit um, implant with guided surgery, I think the whole surgery is literally about five minutes, and that includes the radiographs. Um, so you're definitely reducing the surgical time when using guided surgery. I also do a better patient education with it. So when I present this to the patient, we'll review the CBCT together, and it's actually a selling point for the patient because they look at it and they, they say, I've been to two other consults, the doctor didn't sit down and talk to me, and nobody showed me the technology that you have um, on how you can virtually place the dental implant um, and show me three-dimensionally exactly where it is placed. Guided surgery also can um, make it so that we can immediately restore these dental implants as you saw in the last case. In the last case, in fact, we took out 31 or 27 teeth, excuse me. We placed six implants on the top, seven implants on the bottom, and the patient walked out with fixed provisional um, restorations, obviously once they came out of sedation. But the total surgical time was about four to four and a half hours. And without guided surgery, there is absolutely no way that I'd be able to provide that for my patients. The implants can often be placed in compromised jawbone. We can see, uh, depending on the Hausfeld units, the unique structures of each patient's jawbone, whether we need to under drill or use a bone tap. And if we're doing multiple implant placement, it's just a matter of the laboratory placing a few extra sleeves based upon the planning that you already have had. There are several companies that can help you with this. Um, 3DDX is a very good company that I've used uh, quite a bit, and you'll see some examples of that as we talk further into this um, presentation. One report or research paper that I do want to share with everyone is the importance of guidance um, using uh, surgical guides. And the title of this is called Guidance Means Accuracy a randomized clinical trial on freehand versus guided dental implantation. And I wanted to find a very recent paper, and you can see this is January 20 of 2020. And so in the objectives, a randomized clinical trial was conducted to compare all three known static guided surgery protocols, whether it was a pilot, partial, or fully uh, guided case and compare these with free-handed surgery in terms of accuracy under the same types of conditions. And so what they were really looking for was variations in angular deviation. So angular deviation showed stepwise improvement in significant steps as the amount of guidance increased. So what does that mean? That means all guided protocols turned out to be significantly superior to freehand surgery, but they were not always significantly different from each other. Well, what are the conclusions that we could come up with based on this research paper? What did they come up with? Um, what they said essentially is the following. The results suggest that any degree of guidance yields better results than freehand surgery and that increasing the level of guidance increases accuracy. So the more guidance you use, the more accurate you're going to be. Well, let's take a look at the different types of surgical guides. The first type of surgical guide is a pilot guide. 
This is usually using a 1.95 or two millimeter pilot drill. You'll go to the appropriate length and angulation, and then you'll follow freehand with the uh, remaining drills to get to the final osteotomy, and then you will place the implant freehand. So that's a pilot guide, and sometimes we still use this because we're limited in space between the teeth. A partially guided surgical guide, we're doing a stepwise drilling, and either you may be using keys or non-key drills that incrementally get wider and wider. However, you cannot place the implant through the guide, so you would take the guide off and then freehand the implants without the guide in place. Lastly, we have what we call fully guided. Fully guided will go in a stepwise uh, fashion to the largest drills. And then depending on what implants you've selected, you can choose larger diameter sleeves and actually place the implants through the guide that are fully timed and positioned in the ideal location, orientation, and depth. So we'll examine all three options this evening. So let's look at the first example, extraction and grafting with a pilot guide. Here the patient presented with some discomfort on the lower anterior centrals. She had about class two mobility on these teeth. We went over the treatment planning session with her and we decided that because of what was going on periodontally with these teeth, and the fact that one of the roots had a fracture, um, we were going to remove all four incisors, place two implants, and place a four unit bridge. So if we take a look at the radiograph, you can actually see the fracture on um, tooth number 24. And we can see how much bone loss this patient has. Instead of placing just two implants in the central region, we decided it would be ideal to remove all four incisors because the uh, laterals were going to be going in that fashion since they already had mobility. So we extracted all four incisors. Here we see the atraumatic fashion utilizing the physics forceps. And then we place our surgical guide on. So this is a pilot surgical guide. I always will take a radiograph to confirm that it's seated and that the sleeves are going in the ideal location. This is the 3DDX kit. For those of you who may not have guided surgical kits, this can be used with any implant system. So this is just using the drill sequence. This is not going to be placing the implant through the guide. And in this particular case, we're only gonna go with the two millimeter pilot. We'll examine the area and the orientation using paralleling pins. We'll confirm the positioning. Further drill with the final drill for that size. In these case, uh, it was a 3.5 by 13. We'll place stock abutments, prep them. And here we have the fixed provisional restoration that the patient can actually walk out with teeth. So utilizing guided surgery, whether it's pilot, partial, or fully, allows the dental practitioner to precisely drill, at least in this case, drill, and then follow freehand with implant placement. How about an anterior case uh, in the aesthetic zone? This patient has sor sort of a gummy smile, and she's congenitally missing her laterals. She underwent orthodontic treatment. Here you can see the fixed retainer on her lower anterior teeth, and you can see the tipping uh, of the canines. So the first thing we'll do is use our 8100 from CareStream and get a CBCT. We're not going to attempt this without doing CBCT, and we're not gonna attempt this without doing guided because if you look, there's very little room for error um, between the adjacent teeth for placing these implants, especially in the aesthetic zone. So our goal is to place 
implants in the number seven and 10 position. Here we can see the pilot guide. And in this particular case, because it was so limited, our goal was to use the close fit system from Adin. The close fit narrow is actually a three millimeter diameter implant with a conical connection. So we used the three by 13 in this particular case. This narrower platform allows you to address these narrow ridge cases, especially lower anteriors or missing laterals. And the strength of this uh, implant is very powerful. It's very strong. Um, you don't see fractures and you can go to their website to see the type of titanium alloy that they use here um, where you have a very strong two piece, three millimeter diameter implant. So this is the close fit Touareg, close fit from Adin. And so they also have the larger family of the close fits, which are conical connection implants. The beauty is their threads are designed to have great primary stability, whether it's type two, three, four bone. Um, you can redirect these if you want to. Um, they do have built-in platform switching, uh, which is also very optimal. Um, aesthetics are very high as well as you can torque very high strengths um, without distorting the internal component of these implants. So I highly recommend you take a look at the Adin uh, dental implants. Here you can see my periapical films that I'm taking as I'm doing the drilling protocol. You can see in the first starting periapical films, the limited space between these teeth, then with the pilot guide fully seated, and then we see the paralleling pins where we will be following with the first drill for the close fit three millimeter system. And then freehand these into those osteotomies. Also, the close fit system um, have the osteofix surface. So you can sort of see that surface on the implant in the slide. These help better osteo integrate these implants and allow the practitioner to go to completion in many cases faster than you normally would. So we've placed the implants, we identified that they're fully seated, and then we placed the healing caps. So you can see all we did is a tissue punch. This is very um, atraumatic. And then we're gonna go ahead and confirm with a panoramic X-ray. So here's the before and after. And then utilizing the patient's uh, retainer, we position this to confirm that it's not pressing on the healing caps. We don't want any type of pressure on those. And then four months later, we actually went ahead and took a CBCT. We confirmed that the implant is posi positioned nicely. It's within the bone, even in these narrow ridges. We can see the positioning from the 2D cross-sectional view as well as axial views. And so using a laser, we uncovered the healing caps, unscrewed the healing caps and um, placed the open tray impression uh, posts into the close fit system using the Panacil impression material from Kettenbach, we went ahead and took a full arch impression using a custom tray. We'll go ahead and take a bite and an opposing impression as well. And from that, we had the laboratory fabricate custom abutments. And if we look at the positioning of the implants, because they're in the most ideal position of bone, we know that this will not be a screw retain restoration. Otherwise, the screw holes will be exiting from the facial or incisal aspect. When doing a screw retain restoration uh, in an anterior tooth, we wanna make sure that is more towards the lingual. And because of the limited ridges, we were not able to do that. Thus, the reason for going with cement retain restorations on the custom abutments as seen in this picture. Here we have the final abutments torqued down. 
And then we go ahead and use the implant cement from Premier Dental, clean out the excess, take our radiographs to confirm that there is no remaining cement. And so here we have the panoramic view. And here we have the view from start to finish. Again, there's no way that I would be able to provide this type of precise um, implant dentistry without using some type of guidance. So let's take a look at now fully guided dental implants. We took a look at partial or pilot. Let's look at fully guided. This is a very straightforward case. A patient presents. You see an edentulous ridge with not uh, a lot of uh, bone height. So we know that we want to use an aggressively threaded implant. We want to avoid the sinus. When we looked at the CBCT, we saw um, that there's a little bit of a cyst there. So we don't want to try and do any type of sinus bump or sinus lift, as you can see. So we plan three-dimensionally with our CBCT what we're, where we're going to place the implant. And at the cross section, here's the three-dimensional view. Here we take a PA of the sleeve of the surgical guide. Remember, this is a fully um, positioned surgical guide so that we can not only doing, do the drilling steps, but also the implant placement fully guided. Again, we chose to go with the Adin. This is the Adin Toreg um, OS, uh, the Osseofix. This is the internal hex. This is a very universal implant, aggressively threaded, so that if you're placing an implant into areas of soft bone, we get great primary stability without even having to go into the floor of the sinus. So this is the Turic OS, as we talked about. Again, it's got the Osseofix surface treatment. It's got great primary stability and as well as bone condensing property. Um, and we kept this as a very minimally invasive surgery, as you can see. So this is how the patient walks out. The beauty with the um, Turic OS or the Turic S that have the standard hex that prosthetic platform, that 3.5 or 3.75 platform, which is a regular standard platform, is the same, whether it's a 3.5 all the way up to a 6. So the same healing caps can be used, whether it's a 3.5 implant or a 6 millimeter implant, the same impression post. So the same prosthetics are used for the whole implant line in their internal hex Turig line, whether it's the OS or S. And here you can see we always confirm that our healing caps are fully seated. Another example of going from A to Z. Again, the total surgical time was approximately five minutes for this patient. Again, this builds rapport with your patients and they say, wow, this, this didn't take that long at all. The extraction was a much more troublesome um, experience uh, that I had at a different practice compared to the implant. I was very apprehensive of this, and I'm very happy that you were able to go uh, with implant placement using a surgical guide. So let's take a look at some other examples. Patient presents to my practice. She's got a lot of crown and bridge restorations as well as implants. Her mouth has been heavily restored. We take a look at the periapical film. Not only has this tooth have had a post that fractured, but you can actually see two pins that were placed at one time. So our first goal is to take a CBCT. In our case, we're using the 8100, and we're going to identify where, in fact, we can place an implant. If you look at the position of the root, there was a lot of, lot of uh, dental practitioners saying, well, I'll just take the tooth out and place an implant without drilling. And with anterior teeth, I would uh, definitely disagree with that because when you look uh, at this example, you can see that the root is actually positioned more facial, uh, to, more facial than the position of where there's actually bone. And so if we take a closer look, 
Uh, a great practitioner that I've learned a lot from, Dr. Scott Gantz, talks about the triangle of bone when he talks about planning for implants. And so you always want to identify this triangle of bone. Our goal is to bisect that triangle of bone, not to place the implant in the socket. And so if we do that, we're obviously going to be using a custom abutment to angle it. But again, we want our implant in the most ideal position. And that most ideal position is that area with the densest and uh, the most bone. And so if we measure, we can see this is pretty much the region where we want our implant. We're going to have plenty of bone buccolingually, and we can actually place a 16 millimeter implant. So we actually virtually uh, planned for the placement of an Adin Turig OS implant. And here you can see how we've planned it. And again, just look at the patient's history. You can see various implants placed, various crown and bridge, um, and various endodontic treatments. So that means eventually some of those teeth may fracture as well. We're replacing a canine. So my goal is to make sure that this tooth is going to be strong enough to be able to handle a lot of the biting forces when it's fully restored. So my goal was to go with a 4.2 by 16 millimeter length Turig OS or Osseofix implant as they call it. And we're going to go fully guided. So the laboratory fabricated a fully guided surgical stent. And then they fabricated a custom abutment that was already milled. And so I like to have these anodized so that we don't have any gray hue showing through the gum. And so the day of surgery, we have all our armamentarium prepared. So we're going to atraumatically extract this tooth once we've anesthetized the patient. And you can actually see the pin that was broken off as well in that tooth. So that tooth had been uh, restored several times the, according to the patient, and the post kept breaking off. This is one of the reasons why we chose to place uh, an implant instead of try to restore it again. You can see we've atraumatically extracted the tooth and curetted the socket. And so now we'll place our surgical guide, confirm that this is fully seated. We see that it's fully seated, and so now since we're going fully guided, I'm going to examine the Adin uh, surgical drill kit and insertion tool kit. It's divided pretty much in two components. The left side is all the drills, and the right side are all the insertion tools. Now, the beauty of this kit is that number one, it's fully guided, but let's take a look at some of the other added benefits. Number one, it's a keyless system. So with a keyless system, there's no need to use keys or handles to go to various size burrs or drills. So this makes it very easy for the practitioner to not have to use multiple hands or position multiple keys when going to progressively larger size drills. The other highlight of the system is what they call the active flow irrigation technology. The drills have been created with a unique design that actually forces the cooling saline through the guide to ensure that the irrigation reaches the bone. Otherwise, uh, other systems I've used in the past, the irrigation wouldn't get to the osteotomy and then you were heating up the bone and then you would find that implants would fail. So this active flow irrigation technology is uh, very unique and proprietary to a dean from what I've researched. Also, the drills are self-centering. So this enables the dentist to perform the surgery much faster. Um, so you have a self-centering pin at the tip of the drills. You position that so that the drill is within the sleeve, and then you turn the motor on and is centering itself. Additionally, there's at the top of each cylinder, okay, there's a built-in stop for ensuring that the correct drilling depth has reached when it contacts the guide sleeve. So in uh, cooperation with the surgical sleeves, the drills have a stop. So you can never over drill in depth when using the system. 
And obviously it's very simple to use. It goes from a left to right uh, effort and the drills are identified um, going incrementally larger. And then obviously you have the insertion tools. So here's an example of this particular case. So we atraumatically extracted the canine, we curetted the area, we went through the following drilling protocols for the 42 by 6 Turig OS. Uh, so we have a 42 by 16 length, I should say. This is what it looks like. And so we're going to place this through the surgical guide using the drivers so that it is exactly timed so that the flat part of the internal hex of this implant is facing the blue line. What does that mean? That means that this is orientated with the uh, proper timing so that when we place the CAD CAM abutment, it is positioned as ideal as possible for us to have a temporary fabricated. So we're gonna go ahead and check with the penguin to confirm that we have a good standard reading. I and mean, we see it's 77. Again, this is a 42 by 16 implant and the Adin uh, implants get a very good fixation right from the beginning. So we're gonna go ahead and place our CAD CAM abutment that was prefabricated before the surgery. And you would imagine that we took an impression and this was made after the fact. It is that precise. We confirm that it's positioned all the way down. And here the patient has the final, um, or excuse me, the provisional restoration that they'll be walking out with. And so we were able in less than 45 minutes, extract the tooth, place a 4-2 by 16 implant with a custom abutment and temporize the patient so they could walk out with a fixed provisional restoration. This is the beauty of being able to provide fully guided um, surgical drill systems with insertion tools um, to be able to do what you have to for these patients. Here's another example. Sometimes if you're placing two implants, you just may have to go with a pilot guide. So we're gonna go ahead and re-examine this, get the CBCT. You can see in this region, there was a molar that was angled, so there was a large crown in that area. Rather than just putting a short, wide implant, we decided to go with two 4 2 by 8 Turing implants because of their high stability and not the greatest bone. We anesthetized the patient. And again, we see that the keratinized tissue is not as ideal, so we know immediately that we will reflect a flap. And in fact, we'll reflect a flap with the midline going a little bit more towards the lingual so that when we readapt this flap, we have keratinized tissue on the facial aspect. So here we have our pilot guide. We take a radiograph to confirm that it's seated. We'll do our first, first um, pilot drill. And then once we've achieved that, we see the orientation. I'm going to reflect the flap and follow through with the corresponding drills freehand for 4.2 by 8 millimeter Turig OS implants. Again, we've already talked about the highlights, but if you looked at the radiograph, you see that the bone was not as ideal as we would like. Uh, thus, the reason using the uh, Turig Osseofix implants. So we place the two 4.2 by 8. Here we can see them positioned. And because the ridge is uneven, we actually place additional grafting to the facial aspect of those. Here we have the Osseogen plugs. You can get these also from Golden Dent. And then we use the PTFE sutures. So in that case, we'll just use smaller premolars. I'm gonna finish off with this last case that shows a combination of everything that we've uh, learned this evening, in addition to some restorative and extractions and grafting. A patient presents to my practice who hasn't been in the dentist in many years. When we look at the radiograph, we see uh, a variety of teeth that have severe decay, in addition to some of the 
wisdom teeth that are also affected with large decay. So we know we're going to be extracting all these teeth. We present that to the patient. The patient returns for IV sedation. We go ahead and do the restorative first. So we'll remove all the decay, place the um, composite restorations. This is the Wago fill, which is a great composite restoration. It's zirconium infused, so it's very strong, very minimal shrinkage, low wear, and very radiopaque. So we'll go ahead and place those restorations. Once we've uh, completed the restorations, we'll go ahead and extract the teeth. In the ideal positions, we'll go ahead and place grafting material. In the areas of the wisdom teeth, we may just use uh, either Coloplug or BioViva. Again, we're able to extract these teeth using the physics forceps. These help get these teeth out very atraumatically. And so we've preserved the buccal plate. So at this point, we can just do socket preservation using the osteogen, which come in the two different sizes. So obviously for the premolar, I went with the slim. Primary closure is not necessary when using the oxygen plugs from Golden Dent. And so we're going to continue in the other quadrant, start with the restorative, then extract the teeth, graft in the area of the premolars, and then in the areas in the wisdom teeth, we will place BioViva. This is very uh, nice material because not only is it various bacteriostatic, but it's hemostatic. So it helped prevent uh, bleeding and it helps prevent dry socket, I found. And so this is what that quadrant looks like. We're going to proceed on to the other two quadrants. Remember, this patient is sedated, so we're trying to work within quadrants, uh, one quadrant at a time. We're going to go ahead and extract the teeth. Here we're using the um, osseous cleaning and shaping burr kit and that we trenched around the tooth. And then we use the BioViva for its hemostatic uh, abilities. And then lastly, we work on to the last quadrant, do the restorative. We also did the uh, root canal core and crown prep. And so when the patient came to, this is the Panorex of what we were able to complete. Four months go by and the patient's now ready for implant placement. We're going to take our CBCT. We're going to plan on our CS3D imaging from CareStream for both implants. We're going to forward this information to 3D Diagnostics. If you get a chance, please take a look at their website too at 3dDiagnostics.com. And so their team can go ahead and put your planning into their software, or if you don't have planning, take the DICOM files and start um, creating a plan. And so here we can see what we plan on doing, placing two implants, we anesthetize the patient, use a tissue punch, go through our drilling sequence, and place the implants with their corresponding healing caps. Four months pass, we're ready to take the impression. We check with the penguin, confirm that the ISQ reading is good. We do it for both sides, place our impression posts and take a radiograph to confirm that they are fully seated and then take full arch impression. In this case, we use the identium from Kettenbach and so here we have our custom abutments. We confirm that those are seated and then followed by the cementation of the full zirconia crowns. So having the ability to do guided surgery um, will enable dental practitioners to not only do single units or multiple units, but as you do more and more of this, you'll be able to take on more challenging cases. This is a patient that presented to my practice with advanced periodontal disease. We took a two-dimensional and three-dimensional x-rays. And in the three-dimensional, you can see um, the bone loss in the different 
views. So here in the axial view, you can see there's periapical lesions on some of the anterior teeth. You can see the severe bone loss as well as the limited um, width of bone ridges. Here in the 3D view, you can see it very well. And so our options were the following for the maxilla and the mandible. This patient chose to go with fixed. So we plan for the placement of implants. Ideally, I try to place six if possible compared to four. However, I have used four. Um, in this particular case, we were able to place six over six. And so we chose to go with the Turig OS or OsseoFix implants um, because of their great fixation, but also because of the coating, which allows us to go to final restorations faster. Um, and so we use the guided surgery kit from Adin. Again, we talked about some of the advantages of this implant system. And looking at the radiograph, we can see that in fact, we were able to do it exactly as planned. We avoided the sinus cavities and we have a great anterior posterior spread to where the patient was actually able to leave with fixed restorations until these um, healed. And then we would follow up with the final restorations. Here's a great example of um, another full mouth case with its final restoration. And so these are some of the things we talk about um, at our advanced course, our advanced two day guided full arch implant course. I believe the next one is going to be August 6th and 7th coming up. So if you get a chance, log on to Amplify Dental and sign up. Otherwise, we do have some intro courses starting on implant placement that I believe Kurt will be talking about. This concludes my presentation for the evening. Thank you for your participation. And uh, I believe we're gonna hand it over to Kurt and then I'll follow up with uh, any questions. Thank you very much, Ara. So as he mentioned, we are gonna turn over to Kurt from uh, Golden Dent. Uh, we um, are, as I mentioned, we are very fortunate to have Golden Dent sponsor these webinars. They're the ones that brought Dr. Nazari in and helped develop the content. Um, they've always been kind enough to present um, some offers, special offers, as well as some educational opportunities. Kurt will talk about that. Um, as for those of you who did arrive a little bit late, we discussed the fact that this webinar is recorded. So if you missed any of it, it will be sent out in the next couple of days. And as long as you are on for the bulk of the webinar, you will be sent the CE forms. That usually can take up to a couple of weeks. We had over a thousand people registered. So uh, please look out for that. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Kurt. Thanks, Lauren. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Kurt Lawler. I am with Golden Dent, uh, based here in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Amplified Dental is our uh, educational arm of our uh, the product-based company, which is Golden Dent. And as Dr. Nazari mentioned, um, uh, I'll just mention a few of the, the courses we do have coming up uh, with Dr. Nazarian as the instructor. August 6th and 7th is gonna be our next uh, guided full arch uh, implant reconstruction course. This one's uh, more advanced, obviously. It's a two-day comprehensive program. Um, it's, um, I apologize, it says live patient there in the circle. It's a, this, this one's not a live patient course. This is all done though um, with uh, models and the guides and, and the actual implants um, done on models. So it is very hands-on, but it's not a live patient component class. The, um, the next one, this is what the classroom looks like. This is actually from uh, last Friday. This is our endo course, which I'll mention here in a second, but just to kind of see uh, in general kind of what the classroom looks like and uh, what we do here in our office for our, um, our classroom-based courses. Uh, this is one of the uh, models that we use in the full arch course. Um, that's actually a picture from the course, and you'll see one of the, the participants is actually uh, placing the implant, implant through the um, guides provided by 3DDX um, into the models that we have uh, uh, done in advance of the course for each of the participants. Um, one, I think I missed uh, one slide. Yeah, uh, the other one I wanted to mention here, it looks like I, I missed this one, I apologize. Uh, October 22nd is our uh, intro to dental implants uh, for the GP course. So this is obviously gonna be a more 
a comprehensive program uh, as to what we mentioned this evening. We only had you know 50 minutes or so, so it's obviously we can't uh, get into each of the cases in great detail and what all the exact steps are. And that's what we do at our October 22nd course. This is a just like it says an intro course, and this is a great way to get started with uh, dental implants and, and guided dental implants. So uh, the live patient program. So maybe many of you know, uh, you know, our, our company started with the physics forceps back in, in 2007, and we've been doing uh, live patient extraction, uh, grafting, and immediate denture programs with Dr. Nazarian for for many many years. Um, we took about a year and a half off with with COVID, but we're um, going to be back doing our live patient programs in uh, September, uh, October, November, and December. So we have four of them planned still for the rest of this year. It looks like the next one, I think, coming up is September 17th and 18th. And you can see each one of those dates on our website, which is AmplifiedDental.com. This is uh, some of the pictures from about a year ago, the last time we did one of the programs. Um, you'll see uh, it's very hands-on. So we'll have anywhere from 60 to 100 patients, depending on the program. Um, you are able to work on the patients. It's a teaching facility, so it's very hands-on. So you'll see here in the top left, Dr. Nazarian usually does a, a demonstration with one of the patients doing uh, an extraction, a graft, uh, going over suturing, uh, bone leveling, um, placing the graft material. It, it depends on which specific course that you would attend, uh, but we go over the procedures and then we allow you to break out with a partner and work in your own operatory and we work on patients pretty much all day. So it's a, it's a very, very hands-on program. Um, it's a really great experience you can get here in the U.S. It's, a, it's like a lot of uh, doctors travel, uh, you know, to Guatemala or other, or other countries to do this type of stuff, but we do it here in Detroit. Uh, endo for the GP, we, we just had one uh, last Friday, uh, just a few days ago. Um, we'll post some more dates for that one soon. Our, our first two courses for uh, 2021 did sell out, so we'll, um, Post some more of those dates here soon. And if you have any interest in learning uh, endo, which is not the focus of the program this evening, we'll have more of those dates available so soon on our website. So uh, for joining the webinar this night, tonight, we uh, usually offer a promotional code, which we are doing again this evening. Um, this one looks like it's a little bit better than uh, the last uh, couple of webinars we've done. So it's 12%. The code is guide. Uh, 12, so it's just G-U-I-D-E, and then the numeric one, two. And that's good for um, any of our educational programs, which are uh, AmplifiedDental.com, and it's also good for any of our products. If you're an existing customer or or maybe you saw something uh, unique this evening, uh, we didn't go over a ton of our products this evening. This was more focused on uh, some, some implant placement and, and guided surgery. Um, but I'll, I'll mention a couple of our products here that we're sort of known for if it's something that you're interested in giving a try. Are we doing for 24 hours? So the deals go through tomorrow, uh, June 16th. Uh, physics forceps, like I said, this is what started our company back in 07 for the, uh, the product-based aspect of what we do. Um, we, we're, we're a third generational dental family, but uh, 2007 is when we uh, got into the uh, this product base and educational programs we do through Golden Dent. So physics forceps, this is a great way to extract a tooth. Obviously, before you do the dental implants we discussed this evening, uh, you need to atraumatically extract the tooth and uh, do the bone grafting. So the physics forceps is a great way to achieve that. Um, whether you use an elevator in advance or an instrument that we have that we like, um, uh, designed by Dr. Nazarian, it's called the wedge. This is a great instrument to use in advance of the physics forceps, just to ensure that you have a uh, fully atraumatic extraction site, which is ideal for implant placement. You can obviously also use a luxator or, or, or any type of elevator, but you have to remember this physics forceps that I showed here, it's not really a forcep, it's actually an elevator itself also, uh, but using one of these elevators in advance too, obviously can't hurt. This is the uh, bone leveling and uh, our tissue and degranulation burr kit that we have that we worked with uh, Dr. Nazarian to uh, put together in a, just a nice kit for your bone grafting needs. Um, it's not too expensive. It's just there in the burr block. Um, they're obviously not one type 
our one time use burrs. Um, it has a good good bone shaping burrs, a cutting burr, and as I mentioned, the tissue and degranulation burr. So that's something we do have available uh, if you're looking for um, something for your grafting uh, needs uh, prior to implant placement. This is the graft kit that we showed uh, in one of the cases just quickly. This is just a, it's an inexpensive kit. It's nice just to have it for your uh, bone grafting needs and uh, for your implant placement cases. You can keep everything together in a nice kit and uh, just specifically use it for uh, your grafting versus always trying to find the, the right instruments. So particulate, uh, obviously, you know, a lot of companies have uh, particulate or, um, you know, or, or allograft, I'm sorry, in a particulate form or in a, in a putty. Uh, form. Uh, we have we have both. Um, I encourage you to take a look at our bone graft if you're not using it. This is the one that Dr. Nazarian likes. We have the mineralized cortical cancellous mix. It's about a 50-50 mix, uh, the 250 to 1,000 microns, and then we have available in various different sizes. And then we tried to price it um, very competitive. I think if you uh, compare it to some of the uh, the bigger brands out there, you'll see that uh, our pricing is quite fair. The estrogen plugs, uh, this is one of our best sellers. If you, um, we showed it really quickly in one of the cases um, around an implant, uh, the estrogen uh, slim shaped plug. Um, but if you're not using the estrogen plugs or if you're not even grafting at all, this is a really great way uh, to get involved in bone grafting. It's as simple as placing uh, a collagen plug, uh, assuming you have an atraumatic extraction site and there's no membrane required and it's about a $50 uh, per use plug. Um, so it's very effective for bone grafting in preparation for dental implants. And uh, I, I think Ara will agree that the bone quality is, is quite good uh, for placing implants. Uh, two membranes, I'll mention real quick, the, the Epi Guide on the left is our most popular membrane. Obviously, if you're going to uh, place an allograft, uh, you're gonna want to, um, uh, cover that with a, a membrane. Uh, the ones we have are, are the ones that our instructors uh, like to use. They're long-lasting resorbable membranes. And the, the EpiGuide is a fully synthetic membrane. And uh, that's the one I would recommend if you haven't used our EpiGuide. Um, that's definitely a good membrane to, um, to try out if you are doing bone grafting. Just have a couple more slides here and we'll get into the, the Q&A uh, sutures. You know, PGA sutures can be very expensive. If you're uh, not using our Golden Dent sutures, you'll see at our website they're they're um, very affordable. And then the the BioViva Black Soap that Dr. Nasarin actually likes to use um, for for quite a few cases too are, are really inexpensive. Um, that's a nice black silk suture to take a look at. Uh, the Penguin uh, we showed that through a couple cases. If you have any questions about it, you can give us a call. We do have that available. Uh, one of the really big benefits of the Penguin is, is, is it's super easy to use. It literally has one button on it. It's uh, cordless, handheld, and the uh, the pegs are uh, specifically calibrated for each type of implant system, and they're they're fully autoclavable. Uh, I, I just threw this in here last minute because I saw at the end we we covered one of these cases. Uh, Wego Phil is a composite that uh, we worked with uh, Dr. Nazarian on for a number of years to to kind of develop and find one that we really liked. Um, so this is a, a product that we work closely with him on and it, it is a really uh, good composite for restorations. We showed it uh, at the end there and it was a little off off subject for what we're doing tonight, but the, the Wego Fill is a great um, a composite if you're looking for uh, a different composite material. This is really off subject, but I'll mention it real quick. I always like to mention our uh, new endo line, just why so I have your attention. Um, we've been having really, really good feedback on this. Like I just mentioned, we did our June uh, endo course uh, last weekend, and and uh, th this is a similar file system as, as to the Pro Taper Gold. Uh, it comes in a sterile uh, blister pack, and and I added even uh, you know compared to like an Edge Endo or some other brands, I, I found that uh, I'm getting more and more feedback daily from uh, you know as more and more of these files kind of get out of the market that. Um, our files are, are are really good, and a lot of people like them even better than the uh, Edge Endo or or the Pro Taper version themselves from Dent Supply. So something to take a look at. And uh, I'll leave it at that uh, for this evening. So we have time for the questions. And uh, if you have any questions on like a Dean, we we don't sell 
uh, dental implants, but if you need us to uh, connect you with 3DDX or a dean, uh, please feel free to contact us in the office so we can um, connect you with somebody. Thanks, I'll turn it back to Lauren and we will go through the questions you have. I appreciate everybody's time this evening. Thank you, Kurt, appreciate it. Uh, all right, you ready for some questions? Absolutely. Okay, and as I mentioned to everyone at the beginning, uh, we do our best to get to as many of these questions as we can. There's there's quite a few, and I'm going to combine a few together. So if I don't get to your individual question, I apologize. We do have to end at the bottom of the hour, so uh, we're going to try to get as many as we can. Um, I guess there, in one of the case, one of the first earlier cases you showed is why not take a CBCT when you place the implant instead of waiting four months to check that you place the implant correctly. Well, if you're using a surgical guide, then that would sort of be overkill, and we don't want to expose the patient to too much radiation. So for that reason, I wouldn't do it. But if you felt for some reason the implant didn't go the way that you wanted, then absolutely I would take um, the CBCT at that time. Okay. Um, what are the basic steps for fabricating an immediate provisional? So... What I found is you can do one of two things. You can have the lab fabricate the provisional restoration for you, or they can actually have a Siltec putty or a clear template of, let's say, the tooth that's waxed up, and you can fabricate it in the mouth. If you do fabricate it in the mouth, then you do want to use like a rubber dam or something so that you don't um, push temporary acrylic material down through the sutures um, into the area of where the implant is or into the graft site. Um, so usually I'll have the lab fabricate it. If we're doing a fully guided case, then I'll absolutely have the um, provisional prefabricated. If it's um, not a fully guided case and so I can't have it timed, then they'll either do like a clamshell type of uh, provisional or I'll just have like a Siltec um, impression of the wax up and use it okay. like a regular crown and bridge. Sure. Is it safe to use lasers in an implant region? Yeah, a lot of times people have used uh, lasers to de decontaminate an area. Mm -hmm. um, so the setting that you're going to do is uh, going to be dependent on what the manufacturer recommends <laughs> for um, cleaning the area but not for actually, you know, cutting tissue and things like that. Right. It's more for decontamination. Okay. Um, I know this was, I guess, for the case you were showing, like right around uh, 8.30 your time. Why take a PA of the sleeve? I only see a floating sleeve. What is the PA? Because I'm very meticulous, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it helps when explaining it to the doctors what they're looking for. Um, the f floating sleeve, sometimes if a surgical guide is not seated properly and you take the radiograph, that sleeve is not parallel to the adjacent teeth. It's going on a weird angle. So I'd rather just know ahead of time that, hey, this thing's not seated all the way. Um, the sleeve is headed towards the mesial aspect of the adjacent tooth. So that's why I just tend to always take that radiograph. You don't have to. But um, that's something I just like to do for teaching. Sure. Do you notice a higher success rates when placing a healing, there's a word here, I assume they meant a healing abutment, or when replacing the original implant screw with a complete closure? So if I understand the question correctly, the question's asking, do you find better healing when you keep it as a single stage with the healing cap sticking out of the gum? as compared to bearing it. I would um, think that's, I, that's why I got it to you. Yeah, that's what I would assume the question is. Uh, quite honestly, I would say when using an actively threaded implant system like the Adene, we're not worried about you know, this implant not being fixated. So we're not worried about there being micro movement as you may find with an implant that doesn't have active threads. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is if you bury an implant, usually you're burying it to avoid the oral bacteria to getting to it or because you're worried it's gonna move. Um, so what I found is patients dislike the fact that you have to numb them up 
again in four months to uncover the implant. So now with implants that are highly fixated like the adene, I rather keep the surgery as what we call a single stage, which means when it heals, all I do is unscrew the healing cap four months later, or maybe, you know, in some cases, it may be 12 weeks later um, or less, uh, depending if it's coded or not. Um, and then just take an impression, we don't even have to numb them up. As yeah, compared to the traditional two-stage surgery, where you would bury it, you'd be cut open twice, um, and then you had to wait another three weeks for the tissue to heal around it before you took the impression. So this, um, the single-stage approach is definitely what I use in my practice, more so than burying it. Sure. If short implant success is not much different than long implants, then why use long implants at all with their associated risks? So I I don't know where the risk would be with a long implant as long as you're using um, guided surgery. The 16 millimeter implant that we used was used in the canine region because we had the length for it and because we know later with the way that this patient functioned and broke everything on that side, we want to make sure that this area is protected um, if this patient's going in lateral or protrusive type movements. Sure. But um, yeah, I mean, if you if you have the length, I say go with the longest implant possible. If you don't have the length, then you're going to have to go shorter. If you go shorter, you may have to go wider. So it all depends on the situation you're presented with. It's not one cookie cutter approach, unfortunately. Sure. Yep. When restoring a posterior, do you have the implant contact in centric occlusion or do you restore so when uh, centric uh, shim stock just passes? Just shim sh stock. Uh, usually I'll tell the lab to have it in a very light occlusion. And the reason for that is an implant doesn't have a periodontal ligament. So a tooth compresses when you bite. If you had it in a heavy bite, then what you would find is the implant's gonna take all the weight and then eventually it can fail or get bone loss. So I will tell my laboratory, if we're doing single units or you know a couple units here or there, that we're going to have it in a light occlusion. Obviously, if it's a full arch, there's no such thing as light occlusion. However, in those full arch cases, we will have a flatter occlusal table and not have the steep inclines. Okay. What is a uh, BioViv? Is it like alveol gel? I'm not sure what alveol gel is. Uh, the BioViva is like a cellulose, um, but it has some type of hemostatic agent in there. It looks like gauze, but it's actually cellulose and it dissolves completely. It helps um, with preventing dry sockets, and it helps uh, stop bleeding if there's any bleeding. So I would say if you're using like, let's say a coliplug, um, gel, excuse me, gel foam or something like that, it'll replace that, and you don't need like four of them for one socket. Anyone who's used gel foam knows uh, it takes several of those little bullets to put in a socket to stop bleeding. With yeah. the BioViva, I found that to be the opposite. Okay. Can you explain the pilot guide? How did you create it? And how did you position that initial tubes to be parallel? So I'm not the one creating it. I'm just um, planning the placement of the implants. And so then the laboratory, or in a lot of the cases you saw, 3DDX will plan for the position of the pilot drill. So they're gonna center that in the central location of the implant. Um, but they just, they're limited with the sleeve that they could put. So they just put a smaller sleeve just to get the first drill through. As we saw in like the lateral case or in the lower incisor cases, there's no way to put a full sleeve between those little teeth. Uh, it wouldn't be positioned between the teeth. So the, the laboratory, if you have a laboratory doing it or 3DDX um, would plan that themselves. Right. Based off of um, what, what, what your CBCT shows. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm just trying to get to as many questions we can here. So if you're going to do an extraction and not do an immediate implant, uh, how long are you typically waiting after that extraction before you place the implant? In the upper arch, I'm usually waiting four to five months before I'll um, go to place an implant. If I'm gonna do it as a two-stage, in the lower arch, I'm usually waiting three to four months. Now, also it depends on how complicated was it to extract the tooth? Was there infection present? Things of that nature may delay it even further. But for the most part, it's four to five months in the upper, three to four in the lower. Okay. Um, question, I guess, I guess I think it was the second last case you showed. You know, how long did that entire procedure take? That was, was that all done in one session up to the extraction to socket preservation and restorative procedures? Um, oh, the uh, the one with the restorative? Yes, that was all yeah. under IV sedation. Um, I believe that one was about three three hours. The nice wow. thing is when patients are sedated, you can move pretty quickly. Yeah, exactly. No, I didn't have that luxury when I was doing perio for the most part. <laughs> um, Due to limited interarch space when placing implants in the lower second molars, what is your advice on using a fully guided surgery? Any comments based on your experience? I would say it's gonna to be tough to go with a fully guided in a second molar. So for that reason, you may wanna go with a pilot guide to just create the first osteotomy and get the proper orientation, and then go freehand with uh, shorter drills that may come in your kit um, following that and progressively going larger so that you can get it in. That's a great point, whoever brought that up, because with a surgical guide and the um, extra longer um, drills for a fully guided, some patients cannot open big enough, uh, especially if they're not sedated. So in those particular cases, I will use a pilot guide and then freehand uh, and follow passively the osteotomy I've created with the pilot drill and then go from there. Okay. Um, are you routinely putting implants in into second molars if if all other natural teeth are still there, or are you just kind of letting that let go? Usually, I'm not unless the patient requests it. Okay. The penguin Depends on is that what's the opposing it as well. Oh yeah, that would make sense. The penguin is that the same as a perio test machine? No. So the perio test machine uses more of a sounding where the penguin is like the Ostel unit, which uses resonance frequency analysis. So it, it um, sort of sends like a wavelength um, testing the micro motion uh, of that area. Um, I don't really know the technology exactly, but they work a little differently. Okay. I know the original Ostel was like you know about five or six thousand dollars where when the penguin came out it was cordless uh very easy to use and under two thousand dollars yeah a lot less um is there a certain torque value that you're typically shooting for when you're doing the uh, implant uh, placement and, and crown delivery you mean simultaneous crown delivery or temporary uh, they don't... delivery you don't say this. Does he, does, can he comment on current torque values that he uses during placement and crown delivery? Okay, sure. So if we're doing a provisional restoration, like we saw with the canine, um, an immediate, then we want to be between 35 and let's say 45 newton centimeters. Uh, anything above that would be nice, but usually I'm trying not to torque over 70 or 80. There's actually no need, and we don't want to over torque either. Um, so the go-to, if you're doing an immediate restoration, like a provisional restoration, I would say is about 35 to 40. Um, as well as if you're doing like full arch, usually we want to be within the 35 to 40 range. If it's 50 or 60, even better, but we usually don't try to go over 70. With okay. the Adena implants, I find that they're very aggressively threaded and you have no problem getting immediate fixation, which is nice. Sure. Um, this is a follow-up to the question about the implant length. Um, yes. Some, 
So, so some implants will ultimately become, you know, will develop problems. The longer the implant, the more difficult to remove it if necessary. The more possible bone that has to be removed or the implant has to be removed. So as opposed to placing as long an implant as possible, why not use the shortest predictable implant length as possible? So I would have to disagree with that comment. So my goal is if there's ideal height and width, then my goal is to have the best bone to implant contact as possible. Whether that means longer or shorter, it doesn't really matter. It depends on that triangle of bone. So I'm gonna pick the um, size. And when I say size, I mean width and length according to that triangle of bone. I'm not planning on failure. So I'm not planning on, okay, is this gonna be hard to take out if it fails? I'm planning on success. So my goal is to have the best bone to implant contact. Um, just because something's shorter, I think it's probably gonna have less bone to implant contact and you may have um, other issues that you may have to deal with. Um, so I, I, don't know if uh, that's what the question was directing towards, but I'd have to disagree. Ideally, you want more bone to implant contact, which means more surface area. And so right. in some cases you get more surface area by making the implant or using a longer implant. And in some cases you can't go longer, but you gain surface area by increasing the width of the implant. So it's not a cookie cutter approach, but ideally I try to use as long and as wide as I can, dependent on the bone that's available, following the guidelines that we talked about. Yep. Well, we are at the bottom of the hour, so uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you for you know, a couple of minutes to, to any closing comments, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. No, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you again for giving me this platform to be able to share what I love, which is implant dentistry. And uh, I definitely recommend that everybody take a look at uh, Amplify Dental's website, as well as Golden Dent uh, website, Adeen's website, as well as 3DDX for further information on the uh, various opportunities and their specials, as well as the courses that they offer. And again, uh, Dr. Levine, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to everyone on this platform. So thank you and have a great night. Thank you, Dr. Nazarian, and uh, we are definitely privileged to, to have your ongoing expertise. Um, you know, I would certainly encourage people to take advantage of the specials that Kurt had mentioned. You know, one of the reasons I like working with Golden Dent is that, unlike a lot of companies, they're not all that, you know, they're not solely interested in, in making a sale. They want to make sure that you know how to use the instrumentarium and how to develop the techniques and the confidence to do these procedures, which is where Amplify Dental comes in. And um, you know, it's, it's really, a, it's just like a, a combination group effort to make sure that, um, that you have the confidence to, to do these procedures that all of you are more than capable of doing. So, um, this is like Kurt had mentioned, I think this may be the largest discount I've seen oftentimes to do 10, maybe 10 and a half percent, but 12% discount is, is quite significant. They've got an, an excellent return policy. We don't know anyone that's ever had to return any of their stuff, but, um, I, I know they stand by their products a hundred percent. And, and thanks to Golden Dent, obviously, as I said, we don't do these webinars without their participation um, for bringing in Dr. Nazarian and, and helping to develop the content. Uh, we are fortunate to work with them, usually on a monthly basis. Any of you that were here this evening will be sent an invitation for the next webinar, uh, whenever that is. Um, and as I mentioned, and I'll mention again, the uh, the webinar was recorded. Uh, if for some reason you came late, uh, don't worry, that should go out the next couple of days. When you log off, there's nothing more you need to do as far as the continuing education credits are concerned. You will be sent uh, that information within a couple of weeks. It's all done automatically. No quiz, no test, no verification. Uh, all that gets sent uh, out within a few weeks. So we thank all of you for your time. We know it's valuable. We hope you find these webinars to be informative. Uh, obviously, with a thousand people here, I think we do. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of you on future webinars. Good night, everyone.